Well, good morning, everyone. It, it's good. We got the whole gang back together again, and uh, I'm just glad to say Minnesota did it again. Um, we found commonality amongst ourselves. Um, I want to say a big thank you to the folks you see setting up here. Uh, folks uh, passionate, uh, bring their leadership and their values to the table, and, and do so with a, a, a sense of decency and a sense of what's best for Minnesota. Uh, so, Speaker Hortman, uh, thank you. Uh, these long nights, uh, Leader Gazelka, um, we're just grateful. These are these are hard, hard, and I I would, I'm not telling anyone here. We're one of the two states with divided legislature, and if Washington is any model for that, this stuff should be impossible. But um, because of the leadership of the speaker, um, of the leader, and and their uh, their right hands on this with Senator Rosen and Chair Moran, and of course um, my partner in this, Lieutenant Governor, and all the folks that worked on this. We have reached an agreement on our target numbers. There's work to be done, as there should be in the legislature. Um, we know that this year has been a battle. It has been a battle with a uh, an insidious virus that, um, that took over 7,000 of our neighbors, that sickened hundreds of thousands, um, and now that battle is being won, being won with the vaccine. It's being won by the tenaciousness of Minnesotans. Um, in doing so, we made the, uh, the commitment together that this budget would be about recovering from COVID. It would be about investing in families, their children in education. It would be providing relief to families in the form of tax cuts, making sure that their, uh, the relief dollars they got, um, they're able to use for exactly what it was meant to recover from COVID. We know that COVID did not hit all equally. So we uh, had the ability to set down, uh, grateful, for the Stimulus Act and the, the American Rescue Plan dollars that allowed us to work together on that. We did it in conjunction with one another, and we did it again, listening to what Minnesotans were asking us and listening to what the members were telling these leaders what they needed to see in a bill. So the, the money will start getting out. You'll start to see some of the numbers around this. What I will assure Minnesotans again is they saw a budget that this group worked on last time back in 2019, a fiscally responsible budget that puts money on the bottom line for a rainy day, but invests in our children, invests in our businesses, invests in transportation and infrastructure and finds compromises amongst us. We were able to do that. And I would uh, be glad to say in a fiscally responsible manner to understand that COVID and the battle against COVID isn't totally done, but we have moved into a new phase. We have moved into a new phase where Minnesotans are now back in all of their businesses, they're back in their schools, and we're moving forward. But there's recovery to be done. Part of this money, and you'll hear the leaders talk about this, is we bifurcated that money out, a pot of money that was meant to fight COVID that'll be directed through um, the executive branch, and the bulk of the money, roughly $2.4 billion, that was worked through the legislative process. Half of that was in this budget for this biennium, and the next one will move into next year, the 1.233. So um, it's a good day, Minnesota. It proves once again that our democracy is strong, that compromise is a virtue, not a vice, and that setting down and listening to one another and truly valuing a differences of opinion at the end of the day can bring you an agreement that strengthens everyone, that gives everyone an opportunity to succeed in the state, that took into consideration um, the federal policies and made sure that Minnesota policies were uh, not only aligned and not only conformed, but we were leading on the issues that we cared about. So I just have to say, um, we, uh, we know we always have to push it to the wire a little bit. It's kind of the nature of it. Um, but I think for Minnesotans to understand this, that it, it's July 1st, the legislative process, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough in this environment. It, it, it's not easy. And there is the work, and you'll have questions about this, the work of democracy will be carried out in the House and in the Senate, along with the commissioners, and they will start to decide some of the, the granular details and some of the policy things that, that Minnesotans want to see solved. So um, it's a good day. There's work to be done. The goal is to try and get most of this wrapped up um, towards the end of May, give some time to write these things up and check that. And then when we come back for um, in June to be able to wrap up um, this year's budget. I mean, plenty of time, give guidance to this, to not be disruptive to Minnesotans. And I think, again, with today being tax day, the certainty, and, and you'll hear from each of them, the full conformity around the PPP loans and the full conformity around the UI insurance um, gives Minnesotans the certainty they need. And as of tomorrow, um, we will be putting the money in for summer school and the the certainty that our schools need, our families need for their summer programming and enrichment will go out tomorrow and those schools can start planning for that first week in June when our 
our littlest ones will, will get back in and, and continue on. So just uh, a good day. You're going to hear from the leaders here. They'll take um, some of the specifics, and at the end, all of us will take questions. With that, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so this budget agreement that we've reached today is a path forward for Minnesotans. The COVID-19 pandemic has defined the past 14 months for all of us, both politically and personally. Everyone has felt the impact, but we haven't all felt it equally. And as we reach the end of this very long winter and talk about recovery, we must focus our attention and investments on those who have been hit the hardest. Our schools and students, our small businesses, and our working families. I'm especially proud that we have secured a historic investment in education that lifts up our young people who have been so resilient during these past two school years. Thank you to all of the voices who have kept pushing us for a budget that doesn't just get us back to normal, but gets us back to better. And to be clear, as is often the case, there is more work to do. Our work is not done today, and it's not done when this budget is passed and signed into law. This pandemic did not create the disparities and inequities that have disproportionately hit working families and black, indigenous, and communities of color. It has only exposed and exacerbated them. We have a responsibility to meet the urgency of the past 14 months and take action even when this pandemic is done. But we've shown once again that there is more that unites us than divides us. And Minnesota can lead with compassion and with care for community. It is who we should aspire to be. We found a way to work across lines of difference for the people that we serve, the people of Minnesota. So today is a good day. And with that, I'll hand the mic over to Leader Gazelka. Well, good morning. I think it's still morning. Uh, we worked late into the night, and um, sooner or later we had to come to a, a place of what we're going to set for targets. Uh, it's never, ever easy when you have divided government. It seems like it's going to be impossible. Uh, as we began the year, we just we said, look, we're not going to raise taxes. We're going to focus on recovering from COVID. We're going to pay attention to what families need. And I feel like this agreement on the spending targets it's all of that. We have a, a, about a billion dollars of tax relief uh, and that everything from paycheck protection, that was those, those loans that were given to small businesses to, to keep their employees. Uh, the unemployment uh, benefits, we're not going to tax those either. And then a number of other things that will be in there. That, uh, that was very important to us. Uh, in addition, uh, the legislative branch will have a large role in the almost $3 billion of federal, federal stimulus that came. Uh, we set aside a, a, a pot of money for the governor of $500 million because there's a lot of things that he needs to act on. And then the remainder, uh, the legislative branch has oversight working with the governor. And as you just mentioned, uh, the governor said that uh, summer school, if it's going to happen, it's got to happen now. And so that comes out of that, that pot of money because it can be right away. So it, the, some of the policy issues we're, we're still working on, uh, related to emergency powers, related to police accountability, that's the role of the conference committees. And as they work together, we're hoping to find some solutions there. Uh, but we, we did not address every policy issue at this point. We know that the process should do its work. And so not easy. Uh, the fact that we are very different on many, many issues, it, it really is a tribute to Minnesota that we can figure out how to do it in Minnesota, but the work is, I would say it's not done, it just began, and now we have clear guidance about where to go. And with that, Speaker Hortman will make her comments. Well, um, you've seen this movie before, and you know how it ended. The sequel is pretty similar to the original. Uh, here we are at the end of session. We're going to be going into a little bit of overtime, but you have three people 
who basically respect each other and are, are able to work well together despite huge ideological uh, rifts between them. So I'm happy that we got an agreement done on time and I was confident that working with these two gentlemen that we would be able to uh, get this agreement done for the people of Minnesota. Uh, the question that uh, keeps recurring is why does it always take to the end of session and why do we keep going into overtime? And I would say that you're not driving the same car that you did in 1973. You're not talking on the same phone that you did in 1973. And perhaps it's time to recognize that you don't need the same legislative calendar that you needed in 1973. And so, you know, none of us really relished the once every 30 day special sessions, but uh, the work that we have is far different from the work that was before the legislature when they set our 120 day legislative session. So that is a reform issue for another day. We deserve, our, we, we are um, required to send a big uh, thank you to the federal government. President Joe Biden and the Democratic members of Congress who voted for the American Rescue Plan made this agreement possible today where we were able to do pretty much everything everybody wanted with some compromises. Um, so we're not as strong in some areas as we each would like to be. But we're in a position to give tax cuts, to have historic funding in E12, really um, an enormous investment in education because of the American Rescue Plan dollars. We know that we can take care of the pay for our frontline uh, home and community-based workers because of federal money. So we're very grateful to our federal partners. And for me, the most gratifying part was that we could make this historic investment in E12 education. You know, I have said uh, to the governor from the moment that he became the governor and I became the speaker that we want to be the majority that closes the opportunity gap in Minnesota's um, educational system. We have the resources to take a substantial step forward and to really make progress. We have enough money to really invest in equity and closing gaps. And that's a particularly rewarding piece of this work for me on the money side. Now on the policy side, we do have more work to do. And really pivotal uh, among that is criminal justice reform. I think there's a lot of area for agreement and we look forward to working with our community and law enforcement partners to get an agreement that can pass a Republican Senate and a Democratic House and be signed into law by a Democratic governor that serves all of Minnesotans, that enhances the community's trust in the police, and that makes the police uh, job a little bit easier because that community trust is restored. So this is a good day, uh, but I look forward to the 201 members of the legislature helping to complete the work. And with that, I will turn it back over to Governor Walz. Well, thank you, Speaker, and in a great summary. And I just want to note, there's, this is a, a start of the the budget process. We've talked often. It's a fiscal document. It's required of us. Um, I don't believe you should get patted on the back for doing what you're supposed to do. But I also think listening to the speaker talk about different times or whatever, I, I just want to say thank you and, and acknowledge that from a doing the right thing and leadership perspective and the courage it takes, just to be very clear, to make these compromises and get something done, um, it you are going to hear about it. And, and the interesting thing about it is when you craft a bipartisan deal, it's your friends who critique you the hardest. And that part of it is, is one that we all recognize. And these leaders were willing to say in there. And I, I just think that this, the, I'm just really grateful. The decency and, and I will admit that I get crabby after midnight and I think we kept that down some. Uh, and, and just with that respect, and, and I would make the case to all of you and make the case to these folks, role modeling in America in 2021 in a bipartisan manner is really, really important. And um, it, it did take us a little bit. We get to what may be over time, but it's pretty normal. But the fact of the matter is this is fiscally responsible and each of us got priorities that we see. I think when you do that, there's a pretty good argument to be made 
that a broader swath of Minnesotans are going to feel served by this budget than they would if just one of us did it or if it went the one way. So um, I'm grateful. And, and again, I'm going to give a thank you to the folks you don't see, uh, the nonpartisan staff, the folks at MMB. We were talking about this. Uh, Jim Showalter has worked with every governor, I, th I think he said, going back to Perpich almost, and, uh, and has, uh, has been employed by uh, governors that are Democrats and Republicans because of his fiscal knowledge. And then the staff, people like Wei Wynn and her team, who are there to help advise us, Britta Rayton, who um, help us understand the numbers and, and took, um, took a lot of time last night on, on issues that we are generalists on and need to become deep experts on, and they're the ones that take the time to giving us all on the same page. So with that, questions to any of the group. Yes, Peter. Thank you. Could I ask you guys to tell us what you felt your sort of what you gained out of this thing? Oh, sorry, you guys. What you gained, sort of, I don't want to say win or loss, but what you gave and what you got uh, in this final deal, because we've been talking about these issues a lot. It's hard to look through these numbers and see sort of where you ended up. So I'm going to ask all three of you to just give me sort of a sense of yeah. what your gain and what your give was. That's right. And I think a lot of it gets messaging early on. I, I, from the administration's perspective, recovery from COVID was absolutely critical. Understanding that COVID hit different people differently and that the need to recover us, our children, to recover those families who are most impacted and the small businesses. And I think one of the things that we laid out in there, we wanted to see some significant investments around education, healthcare, some of those things, but also wanted to see relief around middle-class tax cuts. And, and I, I think we got that. So what I would argue is, is that um, we got a little bit of each side. Um, I think, again, I'll let folks speak for themselves, that we think that there are some long-term investments that need to be made to provide stability, because a lot of this can be one-time money. We thought there maybe was a little bit need for that, but the fact of the matter was the financial situation that we're in right now allowed us to make some of these now and then to talk and think about what happens next year. So I think we, one, got a balanced budget that focused on Minnesotans, those most impacted by this. We were able to provide the tax relief that was necessary while still funding those critical programs. We did that all by restoring our bottom line range any day fund and looking towards a future where we're not overspending, where we can't maintain these programs, but we can think about growth. Speaker? Well, I would say we, we celebrate each other's wins because there's a lot of common ground. I, I think that this is an agreement that serves all of us. I don't think that there's anything in the agreement that, um, that we as House Democrats don't like. We fought really hard for a historic investment in E12 education. We do believe that uh, a lot of this one-time money presents a challenge for the future. I think the Republicans and Democrats share a concern that Minnesota stay on sound fiscal footing. For Democrats, that means being able to sustain our commitments in education and healthcare uh, for decades to come. Um, for Republicans, I think that that means that we have the money to meet the obligations that we make. So um, I would say that it really was a win-win-win uh, budget. Yeah, so we've been around each other enough that we kind of know what, what, what the other side thinks, and it actually became more accurate. Uh, if you go back two years ago, we, we had misconceptions of, I think, about what each of us thought. But... Uh, certainly, it was a, is a, was a balanced budget without raising taxes. Uh, then we were, were able to find some, with that federal stimulus, some tax relief. I think that was really important. But I, I would agree that we also thought prioritizing some of the things that we did prioritize, education, resources for health and human services, environment, agriculture, et cetera. Uh, and we do look to the future and say, are these commitments that we're making now things that we can keep in the future. And so that that's always a struggle. And so, you know, in the end, I, I think I think it was a fair compromise. You both have uh, tiny majorities. Uh, do you anticipate any problems keeping everyone on board? Or do you anticipate that the minority caucuses, which weren't involved in this deal, will throw up any roadblocks? Well, other than the bonding bill, uh, I, I think both sides will get the numbers they need. But I actually think you'll find that uh, uh, there will there will be a bipartisan vote. Uh, if you look at what we had to do to get to this compromise, it took Democrats and Republicans having to give up some of the things they wanted. 
and move together to get something they could agree on. So therefore, I, I don't think we'll have a problem passing these. Um, I think it's a combination that works for everyone. It's tax day. Uh, how do the uh, mechanics of the PPP and UI uh, forgiveness work? How will it be refunded to people? Uh, do they have to pay in today? Jim, you want to answer that? My guess is that they have to refile, but he said yes. He doesn't want to be up here. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we, we had conversations about trying to get it done today. Uh, it's, it's just going to get done with everything else. But the fact that we've all acknowledged it's full paycheck protection uh, and full UI, uh, the COVID UI benefits are not taxed as well. I think people can at least know where it's going. I'm pretty sure they got to refile. So we think that um, perhaps the Department of Revenue is going to be able to, to uh, make some changes that, that may not uh, require that. Um, we are going to have to see it be a very interesting tax conference committee, but with the, with the UI of 10,200, anybody who's filing can, today can know that that's going to be deductible. And those that receive PPP loans, when they're looking at what's the bottom line going to be, they know that they'll have full deductibility. So there's predictability in what they will get at the end of the day. The mechanics of whether they will have to refile a return or not is a question we can answer later with more information from the Department of Revenue. So to clarify, I just wanted to get a sense about what's um, what's in this global budget agreement. Is there any policy whatsoever, or is this just strictly numbers that, that the three principals have agreed on? And I'm curious about things like the clean car rules, for instance, which was done by administrative, uh, the, by the MPCA versus the lawmaking process. So I'm curious about things like that um, and whether those would go ahead and, and, and cause any issues. I think of this as a numbers only agreement and um, the others might have a different way to phrase that. With so many things still undecided, is there the chance this could get derailed without uh, a lot of things written down? Well, I think in democracy, there, there's always a chance, but I don't think so. I, I think this sets the tone, um, the goodwill, the compromise. These are hard issues, but I think both the, the speaker and, and the leader, leader Gazelka brought up really solid points. It's the way I feel. Um, it's not as if Democrats don't want to see tax relief for middle class people. And it's not as if Republicans don't like education. And I think trying to find that, and I think the same would be true on some of these policy issues. I know they're a bit thorny. Um, I It probably should be noted, uh, Senator Gazelka, for your caucus, that yes, you did talk about these issues and said how important they are as we that you know we it's not as if we didn't discuss them but the recognition as the speaker said was there's 201 members of the legislature that need to work this through they need to find compromise as we have and and i do think that's there we know that we want to see some reforms around public safety that are shared by both members of community activists and police and and they'll be working on those um issues so i i'm i'm, I'm hopeful this is this is a big piece of this it's not the end it's a big piece. The work will start, but this is where democracy can really can really shine. And I again, I don't I don't want to fall into a Minnesota exceptionalism on this. Where although in this case I think it might be pretty exceptional, this is a pretty unusual thing in 2021, and I think the legislature will keep that going, find compromise, get it done. Can Governor? someone comment on the clean cars rule, though? Because my understanding was the whole environmental budget was possibly going to be at stake if that wasn't settled. So it has that piece. Well, I think settled? a lot of people talked. I think they're still talking about it. We put the environment targets in there and now they'll work through it. And I anticipate there will be lots of uh, robust conversations around different areas and certainly uh, the move towards decarbonization and clean cars will be a piece of that. And that will be with, with the chairs and with the commissioner and, and they will talk it through and we'll see what they come up with. As, as I've said, when we started this process, we're open to hearing where people are at, as long as it's in the interest of Minnesotans, it's in the interest of moving Minnesota forward after COVID. So we'll hear what they come up with. They think they're out there. We'll get them, get them emailed through the target numbers are out there. Uh, yeah. We've been talking about a budget of $50 billion plus. What's the uh, actual figure? Before I turn to the accountants. Is that right? 50? All right. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. 50, Jim. 50 even. Yeah, what do you, 
it'll be a little 50 with this in there, 51, two or something. We'll get it to you on that. So it's roughly in that neighborhood. Um, yeah, it's the federal piece as it comes in, they can, they can get it to you. And again, the accounting of it, as many of you in this room know, deals with this biennium and the tails and how are the tails figured based on what goes through. So we give them the broad parameters, they will start to own that. Speaker Hortman and Leader Gazelka, you mentioned that maybe trying to get most of this done before the end of May and then kind of, I guess, you know, dot the T or <laughs> dot the I's and cross the T's by June. Can you shed some more light on like what we can expect in terms of um, the legislature's work in the next few weeks here? Sure. Um, what I have told my chairs and I think is our, our agreement is that we would like spreadsheets. We expect spreadsheets from our chairs by May 28th at 5 p.m. and language by June 4th. Uh, the only exception to that is um, some newer members or some less experienced folks may have made travel plans that they're committed to. So we don't want, if there's a nonpartisan fiscal staff that's essential to getting these spreadsheets, are there any reporters that have made travel plans because they're less experienced? Um, we it's don't okay. want It'll be after. to miss a booked vacation, um, but we want, we know that these things always take longer than people think they will. And they, it is very easy for chairs to think, okay, we shook hands, we have a deal. But when you write it down and you look at the spreadsheet, then maybe some differences that you didn't realize you had show up. Uh, so we need those spreadsheets by May 28th at 5 p.m. And we need that language by June 4th so that we can be ready for a smooth, um, special session. And we really, uh, the three of us, look forward to talking to uh, Minority Leader Doubt and Minority Leader Kent about the capital investment bill. That's a whole new conversation that those individuals have to be at the table for us to have. Speaker Hartman, also for uh, Senator Gazelka. What's the uh, plan for the rest of the day? Are there, is legislation going to get passed that's actually going to make it to the governor's desk? I know that the Senate has uh, just a couple of bills that uh, would fit that criteria uh, that uh, the House would agree with. I think we'll move those. Uh, we're still having conversations, but I'm pretty sure that the Senate will be done in the afternoon because now we're pointing to directing our folks to start working on these big targets. Normally, we go right to midnight and finish, but uh, we're not going to finish, and we already know what the future is, so I just assume be done in the afternoon. Senator Gazelka, while you're up there, uh, what's your understanding of the handoff of executive authority, if there's any uh, parameters, new parameters placed around that, and then the governor, uh, is he getting it right? We're still working on it. I think that that would be an accurate assessment. If we're coming back somewhere around June 14th, we got to figure that out. You know, that's a, still a thorny issue. Police accountability is, is still an issue that we have to figure out through. But that's why I said some of the, this, this is the targets which is the key thing to actually getting done. You know, if we don't have these, we never even get to those policy uh, differences, but there's a number of things in there that we're trying to work through, but I, I do believe we'll work through. How, much, how far apart is the police issue? I mean, obviously this is just the money today, but have you made any strides on the policy piece of this, or are you leaving that all exclusively to the conference committees? It, well. We're letting the work happen on the conference committee at this point, and depending on who you're talking to, we're either way apart or close. Uh, be, because there are some things that we think that we can do, um, but again, you know, some people would, would want a lot more, some people want less. So we want the committee process to, to really do the work that they're supposed to do. The two sides really, we didn't give them enough time two years ago, but it just, it just the way it was. But they have plenty of time this time, and, and hopefully they'll be able to manage through a lot of those things. Can I ask a, maybe a nerdy question about the federal funds? There were two things I think I heard you say that you were going to set aside, I think you said $500 million for the governor to spend. Uh, what's the process for that? Would he, will he just use the LAC process? And the second part of that is you have revenue replacement. It looks like $1.1 billion. I don't know why. Um, and, and and will that be how how is that used? Will that just be used to balance the budget? Is it flexible money that you can spend however you might spend general fund dollars? Most of it's revenue replacement. Uh, so then we can figure out how to manage the budget areas. Uh, we were the legislative branch wanted control over all of that money. Uh, the compromise is that the governor has 
control over 500 of it, and the legislative branch working with the governor controls the rest of it. Uh, and it's, that's the compromise. That's where we ended up. But again, the LAC process, or is it just an account? LCRC. LCRC. Okay. And then the, the, so the, the also notice that you leave some unfund, unspent uh, ARPA money in the second year of the biennium. Is that just to be spent next session? Yeah, well, that's, that's the point, is we don't know what next year is going to bring us. And so we have those, those resources there. We don't know if, if the federal government's going to come in and, and help with the big uh, deficit we have in the unemployment insurance fund. We don't know what they're going to do related to transportation. And so it, it allowed us some flexibility to, to look next year at next year's problems. I, I think we're also going to have more revenue coming in from the state, especially in the near term because of all the federal money that's been pushed into the state. A lot of people are spending a lot more money we're going to have more revenues coming in. So we're just taking a pause there, but uh, I think it's prudent the way we did it. Senator, Senator how, how do you assess how you did on your no new taxes uh, pledge? Well, the promise kept on that one. I mean, we, I think we, we, we all kept some of our key promises. Uh, you know, as far as the, the funding for, for K-12, I think that, that was a, a promise that I would say that they kept that we agreed to and, and vice versa. Um, I do think that getting uh, all of those employers, I believe it's 350 uh, employees or less, uh, that they kept through COVID and then got the Paycheck Protection Program, the fact that we didn't tax that I think was a big win. But we also acknowledge that all of those people that needed that unemployment insurance, that shouldn't be taxed either. So we, it, it's difficult to work together when we're so divided. Uh, but at the same time, I really feel like we found the place that we can all say is fine. Senator, while you're up there, G Governor, just I wanted, Senator, while you're up there, I just wanted to ask you where you stood on the clear, clean car rules, because I know we heard from the governor, but wanted to hear uh, whether that would continue to be an issue for your caucus. We're, we're letting the committee process do its work. I, I think that's the case. So th there's a number of issues that uh, people are passionate about on both sides. Uh, we, we think uh, electric cars are, are coming, uh, and we have to figure out how do we plan infrastructure for that. We just have a disagreement about uh, the emission standards. We're looking to see if there's a solution there. Uh, but there's lots of little issues like that that we let. We want the committees, the chairs, to do their work. And maybe they'll find solutions that we aren't even thinking about. Governor, can you, can you just address that executive authority issue? There's pretty much four things that you've, more or less, that you've scoped out as, as needed to continue. Uh, vaccines, testing, reassignment of state employees, and then uh, well, actually eviction and price gouging. So that's five. How many of those will still be pending in June, or how many of these are being roped into the, the budget agreement? Well, they have mitigate, business mitigations are off, as we all know. There will be none of that. The last things we have, and I think they're working on it between the House and the Senate to do the um, to do the uh, eviction moratorium. Um, and then what we're left with is just basically managing the, managing the vaccination process and, and managing the cleanup on this. And I know this has become pretty politically charged, but I think one of the big goals was is that I needed to follow the science. Today we had zero deaths and we had for the first time in months under 600 cases, we had 36 less beds being used, which is about a 10% reduction. Um, we think we're getting to that point, as Jan would tell me, one day does not make a pattern, but we've seen this dropping off. We knew that we managed this as we were in the crisis and that we would start to close the toolbox as we have, and the mask mandate was one of the last big ones. So there's a very few things that we just have to manage, and I think that's what we get to. Um, I, I feel confident we'll find a way to do this. I know it's a, it is an irritating point for many folks, but it was the nature of managing COVID, and there was a difference of opinions about how to do that. But the fact is we're just managing basically the vaccination part now, and I think there's agreement that that's that will go forward. So there'll be discussions about this. I, I don't think um, I don't think that'll be a sticking point in in terms of because we've we've all agreed that every single thing's open. There are no mitigations, and people can do as they they need to do. Well, this morning, uh, uh, Leader Gazelka mentioned the the possibility of of uh, forgiving any fines and uh, uh, penalties for for violating. The past executive orders is that anything that you're senator mentioned that is and, anything you're willing to do we took we took that back I, I i think again that when people do violate things there needs to be consequences for them i do believe that you you do that um the thing that i did note is that i think the number and check me on this the number of restaurants businesses that we have in this state 99.9998 
complied without any even written notice, it's a much smaller number that ever received a citation for this. So I think it should be noted that the good actors in this did that. Um, these things were upheld in court as being legal, but I know it's a sticking point. So I said, tell us what you need, we'll talk about it. And I think that in a good faith effort, we're still trying to figure out some of those things. But I think what I would just, I would close with, and I'm gonna give a thank you again, this is always a challenge. Again, America in 2021, it seems for many people that it is no longer possible to do deliberative government in a democracy, that it is certainly not possible to do it with divided leadership that requires compromise or nothing happens. This group of people did that. We did it because it's what I believe Minnesotans expect. Good governance is a hallmark of this state. It is still functioning that way. It took courage and leadership of people to stand up, all with this idea that it is about servant leadership back to the public. And those 201 legislatures now will do their work. This is, again, I, I use the quote, Winston Churchill always talked about it. He said, this democracy is the worst form of government except for every other one. And the fact is, it's really hard. It's really hard, especially where everybody drags into their camps and again, especially from your base that sees it as a vice to compromise, this group did not do that. They rose above that. They have a fiscally solid budget and one that invests back into the public. And so um, we've got more work to do. The path is clear. Um, our expectations, as you heard the speaker and the leaders say, their committees will get their work done by the 28th. We'll get these things drawn up by the 4th of June. We'll take care of some of these uh, other issues that are out there, and we'll button this thing up and put Minnesota on that path to recovery. I, too, echo the positive um, sentiments that people feel as the economy comes roaring back, as the revenues are there. We start to focus on where those inequities were in our uh uh, our system. We make sure that we're bringing those kids back up and giving them enrichment opportunities in the summer. We make sure those small businesses are able to recover and Minnesotans can get out there. And I can tell you, I everywhere you talk and you can feel it, it's not just because it's an 80 degree sunny day. Um, there's a whole lot of things coming into alignment with the end of COVID, a budget that's on the horizon, a summer that's going to feel normal again. All of those things are positive. There's just been a lot of naysaying, a lot of what we can't do, a lot of division. Here in Minnesota, we said these are things we can do, and, uh, and we will finish them. So thank you all. Thanks, folks.